Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Welcome to our webinar, Media Production in a 4K Environment. Uh, this is Christina Clapp from Digital Video Magazine. I'm here with David Salek, who is the Vice President for Industry Marketing at Panassas, Inc., and Alan Dial, who is the Post-Production Supervisor for Ugly Brothers Studios. And today we're going to focus on approaching 4K production workflows. Our presenters will talk about the need for increased uh, throughput and capacity as production companies are embracing 4K camera formats and how to move past limitations of existing HD-based technical infrastructure uh, by embracing the latest uh, scale-out commodity enterprise infrastructure. Um, after the presentation, we'll be answering any and all of your questions. Um, you can submit those anytime throughout the webinar. And once we conclude, uh, the event will be archived, and it will be available on demand from the uh, Creative Planet Network webinars page. And that can be accessed from creativeplanetnetwork.com. So that said, let me turn it over to David, who will get us started. Hello, everyone. This is David Hello. Salek. Hello everyone, this is David Salek. I am the Vice President of Marketing with Tenasis, and I'm pleased to have you join Alan Dow and myself to go over how to overcome the business challenges associated to 4K when introducing it into your production pipeline. So in the agenda, we're going to go kind of a histor historical travelogue into some aspects of how media production has been done. And we're going to touch on how to get it done when it comes to working with 4K and adding it to the workflow. We'll hear next from Alan Dow, as mentioned. And Alan's going to give his perspective on how he's leveraged Panasonic technology to be able to uh, enhance and optimize workflow at the organizations where Alan has offered his uh, talent and service. We'll then dive in into the Panasonic platform to talk about how it's an ideal platform to scale out and support these requirements. And then we're going to talk about some sample workflows where scale out can support various aspects of media and entertainment business. That will include post, broadcast, and rendering and visual effects. Please remember to use the question field, the chat field in your browser in order to be able to ask questions at any time. I wanted to begin by asking everybody to take a visit back into media production. If you're new in this business, this content will look very either strange to you, or if you've been around, or you've perhaps uh, done an internship in a media organization of some kind, you've seen this and you've kind of laughed at what videotape means because you're a very fortunate individual. You didn't have to deal with videotape. Um, but at the same time, you may not realize that videotape was a very powerful thing. It actually defined our experience with media and entertainment, the way it was acquired, the way it was delivered, the entire life cycle of media, whether it was analog format and three-quarter inch and other types or digital format such as uh, digital, digital beta cam and DV format, both standard def and high def. Tape was very powerful because it defined the world that we lived in. What's fascinating is to realize there is no 4K or ultra high definition version of videotape. When you think about that, it literally is a break with history for the media and entertainment marketplace. We're looking at right now in a world where the media and entertainment market has taken into account that when there is no tape format, there is no traditional mastering. There's a lack of standardized procedures around audio sync as was associated to videotape. In fact, there's no video archive process that uses videotape. Um, when videotape defines the file format and the workflow from beginning to end, the challenge that now exists is without videotape, which is associated to 4K, you'd expect the wild west of formats and standards to occur. And that takes into account also that when it comes to the wild west, you could also imagine that there's going to be some bad costume design and some bad execution as a part of that. So what do I mean by the Wild West? What I mean is, are there file-based standards? So the business has been going through quite a transition into file-based workflows, the challenge of migrating from videotape to working with file. But we always had videotape as an anchor in the process 
And we had organizations such as Simpkin on the media and entertainment side and IEEE on the information technology side and other organizations that helped media live in a life cycle that it was easily handled and managed. And what happened is in a world where videotape defined things, there were only a handful of standards companies that were associated to those formats and standards. And now that we live in a file-based world, and 4K does not have a videotape equivalent at all, we have a world where vendors don't really grow marketplace by being compliant with each other. What we have is a market that encourages differentiation. You experience this in the volume of media formats that are delivered to the marketplace today by every manufacturer of a device that can record audio or video in some fashion and deliver it to you on a memory device as opposed to videotape. Commodity design is happening in the marketplace as well, which means there's a lot of challenging economics in play. So a lot of different formats, a lot of different ways to be able to manage and capture and deliver those formats means that the marketplace has differentiation, not consolidation. And your purchase patterns drive these standards. So Apple came out with ProRes HD as their file-based workflow standard for standard F and high def. Avid has DNX HD and now DNX HR to be able to support uh, higher resolution formats such as 4K and UHD. There's in the broadcast space XD Cam from Sony, AVC from Panasonic. Don't forget the DV formats, DV 25, 50, and 100 as well as MXF and broadcast and post. All of those formats are associated with the manufacturer, and there's more manufacturers than ever that are producing formats. Then when it comes to post for visual effects, you have frame-based formats, DPX, EXR, the Hollywood standard with ACES as well, and what you have now is a marketplace that there are standards everywhere. And they're not really just standards. They're mostly about, this is what's ideal for my platform that captures media, whether it's a camera, or a recording device, and how I can deliver that information into the post world is anybody's guess these days, because new manufacturers come out all the time offering new ways to be able to capture media. Our responsibility is to support it and deliver the goods in the end. Adobe, Avid, and Apple now have a new NLE competitor in that market, which is Blackmagic. They've converted the DaVinci platform, a color platform, into one that supports video editing. So now, in a marketplace that pretty much have been settled on video editing, it's getting disrupted again. So the, this additional complication means um, in a world where I live in HD, I'm not yet ready for 4K and all these formats. And you probably even work in standard definition formats or web deliverable formats. If you deliver anything into YouTube platform or the uh, Vimeo platform or you're somebody that supports the life cycle of delivering content into a Netflix or a Voodoo or some of these other non-traditional delivery format, let alone broadcast television. You should still care about 4K because we went through a phase of the business when we migrated to file based where a lot of manufacturers said 3D is the next big wave and we need to modify our infrastructure to support 3D. A lot of people took a skeptical eye towards that and decided this isn't really going to take hold and they watched the uh, uptake of this by various vendors of the 3D experience. This included ESPN, uh, GBC over in the United Kingdom, and other locations. What they found was consumers weren't really interested in wearing headsets in order to be able to experience 3D at a fixed location. Now, if we think about what the future looks like, virtual reality, when you take that experience that's no longer at a distance, that's completely confined to the head that you wear, that has the potential of change, but that's still a very far off technology. Realistically, we have to accept that if 3D wasn't a business impact in my organization, and a few organizations still deal with 3D, but they're specialty these days. Where do you see 4K today? What you're likely to find is it's been in production for quite a while. And what you'll find is that when it comes to storing 4K, it creates its own business challenges because you have to back up that data you have to make, and we expect that you have good backup plans for 4K media. After all, there is no videotape, no original format that was used that captured 4K or UHD and enabled you to save it on a shelf where you could go back to it at a later time. This is a significant break of the way that everybody conceives of or manages workflow when it comes to dealing with 4K and how to leverage it to its best advantage. So adding 4K process to your job 
while still delivering HD work is a significant challenge for everybody. So what does 4K mean to everybody? It's important to take this into account because it means many different things. It's complete madness, really. There's uncompressed formats that have these astronomical bandwidth requirements from 1,200 megabytes per second to 1,800 megabytes per second, and potentially even more, depending on frame rate. There's compressed formats that are quite functional in most media and entertainment workflows, 10 megabytes per second at a very compressed or proxy level, up to 180 megabytes per second, extremely good quality, and yet compressed. Now we have to deal with our reframes or movies. Um, hopefully you realize by now, DSLR comes along and distorts this marketplace, variable frame rate technologies. Hopefully you realize this, this is just complete madness in the 4K landscape. And even when it comes to 4K, it can mean different things from a spatial experience. There's ultra high definition. Is that 4K? Yes and no. UHD is exactly four times the resolution of HD. Take HD as a frame size and go in a two by two grade for HD frames, and that's what UHD is. But 4K is slightly wider than that, so the marketplace is still not standardized between those two. It's not even standardized on ultra high definition as well. Ultra high definition lacks, lacks color richness compared to uncompressed 4K uh, formats. That's being addressed by organizations such as the UHD Alliance, but broadcast engineers are having to push the manufacturers to improve the quality of 4K and UHD so that it meets their expectations as a high quality standard. So now let's talk about, we've, we've talked about the variety. Now let's talk about the complexity. The migration that this business went through in media and entertainment going from, four, going from SD to HD, this is a transition that occurred around the 2009 timeframe in the North American market, the United States in particular, when the United States mandated digital transmission of television. Now, digital is not HD exclusively. Digital can be standardized. It's important to note that uh, the HD ability to broadcast in HD in the United States is only now crossing the threshold of half of all broadcasters. And it's been six years since high definition was uh, since digital was mandated in the United States marketplace. So now the idea of how 4K can impact this market, it means I have to deal with a, a, a product that's at least four times as big as HD. It could be more. If you look at the graph that's displayed here, we're talking about bit depth could vary, the format of the codec could be different, uh, spatial resolution could be among different types. The frame rate could be entirely different. There's 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second or more. You can end up with a format that's much larger than just four times as big. could be even larger. If we look at Moore's Law of Computing, this is uh, Dr. Moore from Intel, who postulated that compute power will increase by a factor of 2x every two years. And this will enable us to be able to keep up with technology and the requirements placed on it. The problem is that if 4K is four times or more the size of HD as a process, workstations can't keep up. They're only getting twice as fast every two years. So the deadlines aren't changing when we add 4K to the workflow. Your future is brought to you by 4K, but we've got to handle this. So when you look at where does 4K potentially exist, it's already here in many places. A lot of theatrical production that uses visual effects incorporates 4K as a part of the process to give us the best graphic experience of those effects, skin tones, and explosions, and textures that are presented on the screen. There's also specialized TV acquisition, especially in sports and graphics and effects. There's also special events. If you go to any live event, such as a trade show or a presentation where there's a large screen display, especially when it comes to sports arenas, you're seeing a lot of 4K displays placed in some of the more modern theaters. Uh, if you go down into the experience in Dallas or the new stadium in San Francisco, in Santa Clara, actually, you'll find that 4K is used for these display areas. Now, to get that media up there, when you're used to working in HD, your transcoders and encoders are your enemies in this case. Uh, they constantly need to be upgraded. And last year's model was not fast enough to deal with this year's format. Take into account Adobe is encouraging upgrade behavior at a very rapid pace. Just in the past two weeks, the latest versions of Creative Studio were released by Adobe. This is the third generation of this product. It creates an upgrade cycle where everyone that works on media and entertainment product to support the formats that are used to capture the content 
needs to upgrade their platforms. And that includes the transcode, because we have to upgrade them in order to support all the new formats. So how do we collaborate in order to overcome these resistance challenge points? We need to leverage our modern production techniques that we use in file-based workflows and divide the labor. The other complication here is the on-demand workforce and production. Alan can speak to this because one of the challenges inside of any organization is working with temporary talent. Production cycles mean jobs come and go at non-scheduled rates. And that means I need to bring on talent as a, as a production manager that can get these jobs done. If you think about it, it's not all that different from how Uber sprang up as a business, but it doesn't have full-time employees, there's the legal part, and talk about how individuals can perform shared services with a car they own to deliver something for a business and then go back to their regular job, which has completely different rules. Now, in the media and entertainment space, that means editor do, editors do more jobs than ever before, but the standards will vary from one facility to the next. One should not expect that the edit staff has the responsibility to maintain standards from one business to another when they move so fluidly between them because this is a service economy we live in today. So feel out on the storage side is oxygen for collaboration. We need a shared collaborative space in order to be able to leverage the best benefits of infrastructure. So the, how do you survive the impact from 4K? You leverage your file-based methods and techniques. You leverage file-based workflows for enabling you to go back to HD projects with 4K and to process your content for HD. It's the right strategy for most workflows. Being able to take 4K content and render it, process, transcode, encode it for your HD infrastructure is the best way to manage the cost of using 4K, but supporting it within the business you have today. It allows you to prepare for the future. So at this point, I get to transition back to Christina to be able to introduce Alan Dell's experience. Christina? Very much. Thank you, <laughs> David. All right. So um, if you are just joining us, uh, welcome to our webinar, Media Production in a 4K Environment. This is Christina Clapp from Digital Video Magazine. I'm here with David Salek, you just heard, uh, is the Vice President of Industry Marketing at Panassas. Uh, and Alan Dial, who you'll hear from in a second, who is the uh, Post-Production Supervisor for Ugly Brothers Studios. Um, if you have any questions about the topic or the presentation or any component therein, uh, you're most welcome to submit them. If you missed any portion of the webinar, uh, it will be available on demand at uh, creativeplanetnetwork.com. Um, and so I guess that said, uh, let's get back to our presentation and we'll meet Alan. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Alan Dial. I uh, run post-production for Ugly Brother Studios. Uh, three months ago, um, I just uh, left uh, Asylum Entertainment, where I was the SVP of post-production over there. Um, we had a... Uh, uh, I'll talk about Asylum quite a bit because that's where I was introduced to um, Panassas, who helped me overcome a, a tremendous amount of, of uh, growth difficulties that I had with that company. Um, Asylum Entertainment is a, a, a large company that uh, is, uh, was expanding quite a bit when I got there. We had an aging infrastructure, of Unities, Facilis, it was entirely an avid um, working environment at the time, um, and we had we were just over doubling our production year after year. Um, what that caused us to do was uh, move into another building, expand the facility out, you know, about a block and a half away, and we ended up three floors on one building, two floors on another building, and I didn't uh, have and couldn't find any um, existing storage solution to be able to allow me to edit on multiple floors across multiple buildings um, and, and, uh, and still have that all be in one centralized storage area. Um, and then I found Panassas and um, tested it out in my environment and then um, was able to install it and bring it immediately into active production because we just didn't have time. Um, let me see if I switch to the next slide here. So 
Growth was one of the challenges, which was simply that. How do, how do I make multiple systems across multiple buildings communicate over the same centralized storage? Um, one of the other difficulties we ran into was just like constantly finding that our schedules were decreasing, turnaround time um, was decreasing, and we really just needed to get things to air quicker than, than, than we could previously. Um, we, uh, we, we were, um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with a, a traditional workflow, which was, would be um, bring in media, um, transcode the media to a proxy, uh, offline edit in the proxy media. Um, once, once we get, uh, once we get to like a, a final cut, you know, take uh, that proxy media, transcode it or relink it back up to high res media, and then uh, and then bring that into an online workflow. Uh, we had uh, 16 simultaneous shows that were happening um, at the time, and I really needed something to just like increase uh, the amount of time that we had in creative editorial so that we weren't spending a bunch of time waiting for media to be transcoded and relinked from the field, and then again waiting for it to get back out. Uh, I also wanted stuff to look nice, you know, when we sent it to the to the network because, you know, not too long ago we were sending everything like straight from like eight to one m standard def, you know, really low res uh, codecs that that were, and still are in a lot of places uh, the standard for offline editorial. Um, we were able with Panasis running at such a high level of throughput capacity to just edit with our native codecs at the time, you know. A lot of XF codecs from Canon, a lot of um, uh, Sony EX codecs. And uh, so using those codecs, um, we were able to just edit right off of the native. So it became really impressive in that environment. We're not only editing off of the native codec from the straight from the camera masters within Avid. We were doing it um, in two different buildings on five different floors. Um, anybody could log in, it provided they had access to um, any of the edit product projects and see what was happening on that series um, in HD. Uh, made the jump from offline became much more of a practice to just like uh, coloring and, and making the show look beautiful rather than um, spending a lot of time like adjusting frames. Um, let me see where to go from here. We, we, uh, it's funny, I was kind of talking about this last week, like how, how much for granted I've taken all of this. Um, it's just really normal for me now to have like multiple edit systems across multiple locations all working in HD. Um, and and what, what then started becoming um, difficult for me was uh, just the moving around of media. Um, uh, it used to require just a tremendous amount of planning. You know, how to take an entire project and then archive it, which would inevitably come up on another series or the same series in another season. And what we traditionally had to do, of course, in the videotape days was, uh, you know, redigitize all of the tapes and uh, relink them to the original projects. You know, it's kind of not a thing anymore. Uh, with Panassis, I've been able to take um, a virtual volume system and, um, and in that virtual volume system, I can just archive everything right the way that it is, right from Avid, as an Avid project even. Um, I haven't a tremendous amount of experience um, working in other nonlinear editors, although I've 
um, dabbled with them, and they all look to me like it would be exactly the same for them. Just wrap everything up right in its own file system, and when I bring it right back online from like an LTO archive, it all comes up within its volumes, and I don't need to log anything or keep a giant text document in order to try and figure out how to relink my project or bring it back from the dead. Um, so that just turned into um, an unexpected, uh, you know, fa fantastic thing for me um, when using Panassis. So, you know, moving on to, let me move to another slide here. So while, while I was at Asylum, um, we continued to grow. And um, we actually ran out of storage space. <laughs> we were able to, um, so I, I have done this in the past. And when I, when I did it with uh, traditional storage systems in the past, what you would do is um, you would call the manufacturer, the uh, value-added reseller you got your storage solution from. They would bring in another one that was like twice the size um, or worse, like uh, half the size of what it was you were going to, you know, your same size. You would kind of migrate everything off of the storage platform um, and then like add the new one to that, making a larger bucket, and then bring everything back online, deal with whatever problems with the corrupt media or anything that happened in that transfer. And then, um, and then you would now have a larger storage platform that you could share out to uh, your people. Uh, when I had to add a new, when I had to add like a larger set to the Panassis uh, that we we're running at Asylum, I just put another shelf on, and then um, it just incorporated itself right into the other shelves that were there, and it was just larger. And not only was it larger, it added um, that it added in parallel the same amount of capacity to what it had previously. So the first time I did it, I doubled, and then the next time I did it, I added a third more. Both capacity and throughput increased with it, which was, you know, fantastic. Um, Anyway, uh, that's kind of been my uh, experience with Panassas. I think there's probably a lot more to talk about. <laughs> but uh, thanks, thanks for uh, letting me share it with you guys. And uh, I guess I will turn it back over to Christina now, and we'll hear Beautiful. more from David. Yeah, yeah thank you, Alan. Um, so if you're just joining us, uh, I'm welcoming you to our webinar, uh, Media Production in a 4K Environment. It's Christina Clapp from Digital Video Magazine. I'm here with David Salek, who is the Vice President of Industry Marketing at Panassas, and Alan Dial, who you just heard, uh, who is the Post-Production Supervisor for Ugly Brother Studios. So if you have any questions about the topic, the presentation, questions for David, questions for Alan, um, you're most welcome to submit those at any time. Uh, if you've missed any portion of the webinar, it will be available on demand at creativeplanetnetwork.com. But um, let's get back, uh, back now over to David. Thank you, Christina. And thank you, Alan. I really enjoyed hearing your direct experience with uh, the challenge of business growth and how your facility experience gave you insight into uh, the desire to be able to find a better way in order to be able to handle business change, uh, in, order to, in order to be able to be more efficient with that part of the process so you could focus on improving the quality of what you made. Um, that really speaks to me as somebody who has, like you, worked with creatives, that we want technology to support the creative process. So as a part of that story, I wanted to briefly touch on uh, a little bit more about Panassas and at this point discuss uh, how it fits into the media and entertainment market. You've heard Alan's example, but it helps to understand some building block fundamentals of what Panassas is in order to be able to 
kind of uh, consider why it might be a good choice to be able to address the challenges that Alan shared, among others. So Banassas is a scale-out storage platform. It has a name called Active Store. It's a collaborative platform, ideal for sequential workflows. Um, this is a company that's been around since about the year 2000. So it's a company that happens to have developed a technology very ideal for high-performance environments and workflows. So one can consider, given the variety of options out there in the collaborative storage marketplace for media production, why Panassas? What you'll find is media and entertainment benefits from a scale-out technology that is the core of how Panassas works with the Active Store platform. It's a future-proof concept. As Alan expressed, the idea is you deploy today what you need, and then you expand based on the business growth. So whether that's uh, running out of room or needing uh, to support another job and adding more artists that are going to perform more I.O., there's a variety of ways that you need to support that business growth. You want to avoid data migrations in the process. And that's very challenging for most vendors of storage in the market is usually it means buying another instance of the same thing or a different larger one, and there's no integration with the core. So you want to be able to grow it, but you want it to be easy. It shouldn't require technical knowledge to be able to accomplish the work of growth, and you want to be able to focus on creativity. You shouldn't have to be a technical person on storage knowledge. So when it comes to what that means in the market, it means this is what Panassas scale-out architecture looks like. The idea of scale out is all parts grow. So in an active store appliance, it can be quite large. It can actually start fairly small in capacity, but it can be up to 122 terabytes in one 4RU chassis. It's fully redundant for all components inside. It offers really good performance at up to a gigabyte and a half per second of throughput. That's a capital B uh, per chassis. It's a product designed to protect your data. So it uses a technology called RAID 6 Plus. This is an enhanced horizontal and vertical protection scheme that leverages everything that RAID 5 and 6 did and adds additional protection capabilities to it beyond what most vendors offer in their product. We make it easy to install and manage because all the components you need are part of the scaled solution. I'll start up in the upper right storage node. So that node is a component that contains either a, a pair of four, six, or eight terabyte SATA drives, also contains a solid state disk, also contains an Intel CPU, and cache. It enables parallel read writes because there can be any variety of those from eight to nine to 10 of those inside of a single active store appliance. And it contains an advanced caching algorithm family associated to it because it runs an operating system called PanFS. There's also a director node it contains CPU caching network, and it orchestrates the file system activity and, for, and also provides metadata services so that all the data has full awareness within the platform. And when you add more of these, you can end up with a full rack of that, which includes up to 10 of these active store appliances, each one containing a director node for metadata and storage nodes for your capacity and throughput. So the full system is designed to scale and there's a switch module included for being able to connect to your network at 10 gigabit ethernet. It's a very simple system when it comes to protocols for supporting Mac systems, very prominent in media and entertainment as we know, Windows systems, and ultimately Linux clusters. There's been this emergence in media and entertainment of leveraging the power of Linux and Unix to perform large tasks, complicated tasks at scale. So for Mac systems, that's using NFS. For Windows, that's SMB. For Linux, we offer our own protocol. It's called Direct Flow. They all integrate with our PanFS parallel file system to talk to a variety of our platform nodes, our platform shells. These are our Active Store family, ranging from products three years ago, four years ago, our Active Store 11 and 12 products, up to our current product, the Active Store 16. Those products can mix together to form a single namespace that's easy to manage and scale. So let's talk about direct flow, this particularly unique technology to Panassas. When you look at the scale out marketplace, there's a few vendors that offer technologies that let you grow the platform in an easy manner, and you get a sense that the performance will grow with it, but 
the performance is only going to be for throughput. It won't be for metadata. And that's a challenge that most scale-out technologies have. They're not really scale-out. They're more scale-up. Anastas addresses that with our director node, where you scale out the metadata access. But for high performance, you need a better way to deliver throughput today. And that's our direct flow. Scale-out is not enough for being able to deliver the business needs, especially when preparing for 4K production. You need the best performance for processing this format of 4K into HD for delivery, but you also want to be future-proof for the time when eventually 4K is what you deliver as a finished product. Direct Flow solves the parallel I.O. challenge. It's a driver for Unix and Linux clients that offers up to wire speed 10 gigabit Ethernet performance for those clients. Each client accesses multiple active store nodes in parallel, so it is about one-to-many performance for a single client. Clients do not have to be 10 gigabit Ethernet. They can be 1 gigabit Ethernet. We support both ranges of connectivity. And when it comes to being an open platform, we presently support Mac and Windows clients by allowing the same access by NFS or SMB protocols into the environment where Linux clients access via the high-performance direct flow. One can anticipate that in the future, it's not going to be that long before we see a world where it's not only Linux platform that gets the benefit of direct flow. So you'll want to stay tuned to what Finances has to say around the NEB timeframe next year. We'll have more to talk about with direct flow than just Linux. Finally, I want to talk about how this design, this architecture, proves that hard work pays off. We did the hard work so you don't have to. Our Active Store platform uses Flash in an intelligent manner that balances high performance and cost. In this diagram, we talk about the mix of SSD and SATA to give you high performance sequential workflow with high density and high performance for the metadata and random I.O. that SSD provides. You get a broad workflow range that you can throw at a Panasonic platform for direct flow with extreme performance for sequential workflows, NFS and SMB SIFs for simultaneous access without gateway servers, and you end up with a platform that protects the data with, a, with one of the strongest industry-proven solutions out there for data integrity and quality. This is a platform that's been proven to robust in the real world. The legacy of Finances as a technology is that it's been adapted very strongly in the research space. You'll find that organizations such as Boeing and Airbus use Panasonic technology in order to be able to design highly sophisticated components such as composite wings and airflow and optimum design for being able to perform fluid dynamic engineering in order to uh, get the most uh, power out of a lightweight component when engineered and delivered in the marketplace. Technologies that you and I touch every day that's where Panasonic has been used traditionally in order to be able to perform high performance computational tasks. And this performance platform is now part of the media and entertainment workflow process because it turns out that scale out needs in research are ideal platforms for media and entertainment. At this point, we're going to talk through some of the process that exists for workflows in media and entertainment. I'll start with a very strong traditional one, and that's video editing. You see the logos we have here represent Apple with their Final Cut platform, Adobe with Creative Suite and Creative Studio, Avid, of course, as the 800-pound gorilla of professional video editing. The new entrant, if you haven't been paying attention, Blackmagic has modified their DaVinci color grading platform to support video editing. So now the landscape just got more complicated. A workflow example that we, walk through, that we walk through like this, if we think about it as stages of workflow, these are all of the ways that media is brought in these days on hard drives or transported via uh, wide area networks over broadband connections uh, or even FTP. And it's ingested and stored so that all of these subsequent steps, if you count them, there's nine stages that happen from offline editing to review and conversion and linking to the high-res editing and then additional review, color correction and timing, mastering audio, and quality before delivery. The goal we want to offer is that this circled area can be eliminated in a scale-out fashion because the scale-out platform supports the performance need that you don't need to perform an offline edit. You can actually make that task happen, as was expressed by Alan and many other customers that have performed that task with us. And you end up with a workflow that looks like this. We, we remove stages of production 
and improve the efficiency of the workflow with a platform that can scale out and support the throughput requirements of post-production editing. In addition, new platforms have emerged in the marketplace. Adobe has offered one called the Anywhere platform, where the concept of proxy editing completely goes away. And instead, editing workstations are able to edit off of high-resolution media that is converted to the bandwidth of the edit platform in real time using the Anywhere cluster. That cluster is able to leverage the power of scale on a Panassas platform to be able to perform those conversions and operations in the data center in a parallel fashion. So we look very we look forward to working closely with Adobe to be able to deliver this experience as we see edit technologies improve and embrace the concept of data center driven computing. One of the next workflows that I want to talk about is in the broadcast space. There's a couple of ways that you could approach broadcast. One of the traditional ways is about live production. So there's a particular place where Panassas offers capabilities to live alongside broadcast technologies, such as those offered by Belden, their Grass Valley division. And what they offer with their technologies, they offer a very strongly mated platform which has their K2 storage cluster for, for supporting K2 edit workstations, Aurora workstations, and the live broadcast and cameras that are used to be able to incorporate that content. But then that content gets wrapped in a format called MXF, and that needs to be able to support you for, be supported for editing. It's usually best to give editors their own platform to be able to perform those workflow requirements for polishing the content for playback to air. And that's where Panassas can live alongside broadcast partners, such as Harmonic and Grass Valley, and being able to deliver those workflows in that supported fashion. One can look at what's powerful about broadcast is the adoption of Ethernet to be able to simplify the workflow environment. And this is where Panassas stands out as a scale-out Ethernet-driven technology. By eliminating SAN topologies, you can connect everybody on a simple Ethernet layout. So content creation and editing, connected through workflow management and asset management, tied to playout servers and content distribution platforms as well as acquisition, can all be wired in together across an Ethernet LAN. The last area I want to talk about is render farm architecture. This is a core sweet spot for Panassas because if we look at how these operations are run in, with these application platforms such as New Studio, Autodesk with Maya and their other 3D creation applications, as well as platforms used for being able to render and convert that content into what we visually see as the amazing animation or composite finished product with detail that it astounds us as a experience. One could look at a render farm workflow where the modeling layout, coloring, and review process is all something that's highly collaborative across dozens or hundreds of artists. And they need to be able to touch storage that allows them to be able to access all those assets, including uncompressed media assets that have come in in frame-based formats, such as DPX, EXR, as well as high frame rate formats from tools that are able to capture these incredible frame rates, things such as the phantom camera. So that requires a scale-out storage because this media is captured in formats that go beyond 4K into 6K and even 8K. So you need a scale-out to hold that on the storage side. You also have render servers. These usually can fill a rack or two to be able to process all this data and convert it into a format that can play back smoothly. And then what you end up with is a format that is highly idealized because for Panassas, because render servers, generally that market prefers the Linux platform for being able to run those storage servers because they're able to process that stuff at the highest performance possible since Linux is ideal for extracting the most out of hardware to perform the render process. As we look at rendering as a workflow, it's extremely complicated, very time intensive, and the goal is to deliver the process and meet the deadlines with the best looking product possible. And this is what Panassa supports with direct flow for supporting the render server process. We have customers that have experienced this against the best scale out alternatives in the marketplace today. And Panassa is able to complete the job in half the time or less by using direct flow in combination with Linux render farm servers and working with clients that could be either Linux based or a mix of Linux Windows, and Mac. So at this point, I want to be able to 
offer to your, your viewpoint. When you consider your next media and entertainment storage purchase, because your business is experiencing these challenges of dealing with 4K formats and how they're going to impact your HD workflows, you need to consider does the storage vendors that you're looking at offer the ability to scale out their platform? In addition, do they have an optimized protocol to do this with? For example, a direct flow or something similar. And can they offer data protection strategies, such as RAID 6 and snapshots and bundled quotas, and do this without any cost uplift so that you get all of this included in your storage platform? In addition, does your storage vendor take an approach that keeps the storage cost from going up after you've deployed it? One of the things that Vanessa takes pride in is that we keep storage prices flat after year three. Does your storage gen vendor support heterogeneous models in a single configuration? As Alan was touching on, when your business grows and you need to add a denser platform, can you do that compared to what you started with? And finally, can your system scale horizontally and vertically without data migrations as you add those components? Does it make that process easy? Does it allow you to focus on being creative and incorporating 4K media into your HD pipelines? so that you can deliver your content with the latest that 4K has to offer, which is higher resolution, greater frame rates, all that flexibility and complexity. The simple question you can ask on this is, ultimately, if any of these answers are no, you should consider Panassas and be ready for 4K production. At this point, I'm ready to transition to a question and answer period, where hopefully we've seen a few questions come in. And Christina, would you like to help again? We have indeed. Some of this? Absolutely. All right. So let's see. Our first question um, is uh, it's it's from a someone working in a university environment. So um, they are asking. He is asking. She is asking. Um, in our workflow at the university, we need to start small, uh, like 100 terabytes, then scale out. Uh, we also need to support seven uh, edit workstations for limited collaborative work, then deep store, uh, masters, and raw forever <laughs> ellipses. Uh, so uh, wanting to hear your thoughts on that. It's not uncommon that organizations take this approach, which is how do you plan for a future of change to live with the budget reality we have today? So it's a, it's a very ideal question because it embraces the best that Scale-Out has to offer as a technology. So starting small it should be incorporated into the design approach of any good Scale-Out technology. Finances takes it in a particular approach where our smallest platform can be as small as 40 terabytes and can scale up to as large as 122 terabytes today. There will be larger versions coming, but we recognize that starting small is critical when organizations have limited budgets. So the ability to have flexibility is key to be able to start at the right point in time with the right budget. In addition, one of the next things to consider is, as you grow, you need to be able to take advantage of the next platform that may offer better density because you have the business justification to take on that requirement, and that usually brings with it the budget that allows you to afford the expansion because you present the business case that the expansion is required in a file-based workload. All of the camera originals are file-based. Remember, there is no videotape for 4K or UHD anymore. So if you want to save that camera original, it has to land somewhere where you can process it and convert it. And eventually, a couple of years down the road, when you're ready, go back to that 4K source footage and reuse it again. That could be a particular key interview with somebody or an event, a sports event, a historical event that you want to capture the best res resolution. So being able to support the business at the point of need, start small, and scale to grow out, that absolutely is a, a critical part of what Panassas incorporates and any good scale-out technology should. It should not force you to abandon what you started with, but instead should incorporate the next better version and merge it. Ultimately, when it comes to archive, we've got a lot of options emerging in the marketplace. One of the most popular is cloud, but there's concerns around security and making sure that assets don't get in the wrong hands, especially from a rights management point of view. 
fortunately, a lot of organizations seem to be coming around to understand what's important when the Motion Picture Association of America puts out their audit standards to ensure content is secure, whether that's on a private environment such as a university or in an environment that is a hybrid, shared private and public resource right. type of approach. So Manassas takes the approach of being open to the most dense, least data movement solutions out there and supporting what you need for the high performance workflows on premise today, where you need scale out to support the business requirement on premise. So looking for a vendor that offers both scale out capabilities and recognizes the best of what really cheap and deep can do in the marketplace, which is very hard to accomplish production with cheap and deep. It's usually one or the other. And find that balance would be the recommendation I could offer. Got it. Thank you. All right, uh, next one, and we have a lot, so we'll try to get through as many as we can um, before the hour is out, but if not, um, then uh, we'll uh, get you those answers uh, on a sort of one-to-one -one basis. But next question, um, I shoot uh, 1920 by 1080. Uh, what is the quality of up conversion to 4K? I'm not at 4K yet, but can rent those cameras. Meanwhile, dot, 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 so another <laughs> yes. thinker. So... This is, this is a, a perfect question for thinking about what's the reality today, which is I shoot in HD, I deliver in HD, or even less lower resolution formats if I deliver to the web. So what is the quality of up conversion for HD when it's uh, shifted into 4K? A lot of that has to do with the tools used to perform that up conversion. Surprisingly, the tools are actually quite good at it. Um, you have specialized tools. Blackmagic has their acquisition of Teranex and what those tools mm -hmm. have lately been able to prove for being able to convert that content into 4K. Um, being able to have the most information possible when shot in HD, 1920 by 1080, is critical to the quality of what you get when upconverted in the future. Fortunately, there's a lot of post-processing that allows that upconversion quality to be improved and meet your expectations it's usually best done as a non-real-time process. When you give the convert up conversion process greater than real time, so if I have an hour of content and you give it two to three hours to process and convert, your results will be better. And some workflows that time is not there, and there are real-time up conversion tools. Even lately, some of the specification for the 4K, or in this case, UHD Blu-ray format, is about being able to play standard definition DVDs, and Blu-ray HD DVDs and up converting those into UHD TV playback and perform that real-time conversion in reasonably good quality. You'll see a variety of solutions that offer good, better, and best, and they're going to be pricing associated to those. But if you take a longer than real-time process, you'll get the best results. And that's working with organizations that perform transcode, the strong traditional players, folks like Telestream, as well as emergent players, folks like Elemental, and the real-time encode, recode uh, tools, the Terranex, as I mentioned, and others, allow you to be able to convert those. And ultimately, the edit applications themselves. You don't even need to support 4K for editing purposes. If you're delivering in HD, you can render that into HD format and save that 4K asset for when the edit application you use today, you're ready to use the next version down the road. Got it. Um, okay, so let's see. Next question, um, kind of a real-world application question for Alan. Um, all right, so uh, SMB uh, with OSX Yosemite is very problematic. Have you had any info? Have you had any experience or any recommendations uh, with Yosemite clients connecting via SMB to Panassas? So, um, yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, the, what? What we're able to do with Panassas is actually avoid this problem, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure if this will be able to answer it totally directly, but what what due to the fact that the underlying file system of Panassas is PanFS and it's speaking to itself in direct flow, it can then share out um, the file system via direct flow to Linux, NFS to OSX and SIFS or SMB to Windows, that same share. So you could connect Windows clients via SMB. You could connect OSX clients via NFS and still have all of the background um, enterprise trade-off 
that you would get as if it were all connected via the same um, file system. Uh, hopefully that can answer it. Um, it is truly like a heterogeneous working environment in which uh, you don't tr really have to worry about. You can just pick the best connection point for the type of machine that you're connecting to it. Gotcha. Um, okay, thank you. Um, let's see, next question. Uh, what compression are you using to utilize transport of 4K over a uh, 10 uh, gigabit uh, network? This is David. I'll handle that question. Okay. So, the con so the concept of uh, transport of 4K over a 10 gig connection for a client. Uh, when we talk about transport, there are two modes to consider when considering 4K. There's the data movement requirement to be able to take the content and move it to shared storage so it can be processed in a non-real-time fashion. The computers will go as fast as they can, um, but not necessarily at real-time human-perceived data rates. And then there's real-time, which is what we perceive as smooth motion. And that's why in a 4K world, the proliferation of formats exists. Because uncompressed versus compressed makes a big difference for considering what do you want to support in your infrastructure. Not only is uncompressed 4K at 24 frames per second, about 1,200 megabytes per second, when defined in that way, and it's a capital B, so it's 1.2 gigabytes per second, nearly line speed 10 gigabit Ethernet. But Many of the very good codecs out there today from Apple and Avid, uh, including on the Apple side, uh, the ProRes Quad 4, as, uh, as it's known, mm -hmm. which is the 16-bit or float version uh, of 4K, that is significantly lower in bandwidth, but contains, as a 10-bit space or even larger 16-bit float space, nearly all of the human perceivable and even beyond human perceivable color space. On the Avid side, that's the newly introduced DNX HR format for high resolution format to be able to support 10 bit in 4K and UHD formats. So when you look at those formats, they exist for a particular reason. In production, it makes no sense to try to get 1,200 megabytes per second to every desktop when you can do it with one quarter the bandwidth and get visually the same results using these powerful, highly optimized compressed codecs, and yet when they are 10-bit and 16-bit space, you're not losing the data. So that's the best way to consider from a transport perspective. You can transport over 4K content at the uncompressed state, run it through a transcode process or encode process using some of the latest tools, and that can even be the edit application itself that can convert that into ProRes Quad 4, Pro, ProRes HD HR. And on the DNX side, that's DNX HR for working in these high resolution state formats. And then output a DNX HD format, which is more than compliant from a broadcast delivery point of view. All the quality is there that the broadcasters expect, even PBS at their highest standards. So the ability to have that flexibility is very critical to the business. Right. Oh, boy. All right. Um, so it looks like we have time for exactly. Uh, uno more question, um, and uh, and then the rest of your questions will be answered directly. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll say a thank you at the end. But thank you all. These are such good questions, so interesting, um, and, uh, and and pertinent. So uh, let me quickly get to uh, one more, and and then we'll close it out. Um, where should I draw the line in relation to quality, value added, and the cost of storage? One of the things that's going to drive that, first of all, there's absolutely you can't get over what budget offers you. And then you have to balance that against what you're trying to deliver as the best quality of the product. And for the creatives, the technology and the budget required to get the right technology should be invisible to them. The creatives want the best tools to deliver the best results. That's their integrity as they approach their job. So the value add is about the the, the creative ability for everybody in the production food chain and the, and the process to be able to deliver exactly what they want. Um, when it comes to balancing quality and cost of storage, what you'll find is the best way to accomplish that is buy only what you need. Don't buy what you think you need. In other words, 
That's what scale out is meant to do, is allow you to be able to scale to the point of need rather than anticipate that and drive up the cost. So if you plan on a project coming in, but you're not sure if it's approved yet, and you're already doing work with 50 terabytes worth of shared storage, if it's a scale out platform and you get that next project, your existing projects are not going away. And you need to get them done too. That's a scale out scenario and the technology should support growth of the common workspace so that from the creative point of view, they have no idea the environment changed except that it holds more data and they can work with more content and use the right tools to get the creative content done. So thank you for asking these great questions. Hopefully that uh, is insight into some of the capabilities that we feel our product offers. And you in general should just look for scale out in your platforms, but you should also look for more in that. I also want to thank Alan Dow for participating with me in this session. And Christina, back to you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you all for joining us. Thanks to David and Alan for their time and expertise. Um, and thanks to Panassis for making this webinar possible. Um, if you want to access any portion of this webinar, you can find it on creativeplanetnetwork.com, and you can see all the Panassis contact information here on the screen. Um, so thank you, everyone, and um, have a great rest of the day.